So, this is a course on algebra the number is 203 b and in this course we will essentially introduce algebra again to you. I am sure you have all done algebra in some form of the other used algebra in many forms actually, but uh, what I am going to talk about is the modern version of algebra the way it is used to understand and study different mathematical concepts. And that is something that perhaps many of you have not seen, may be partly seen, but not seen as a uh, development from the basics to the higher levels and that is what we will do in this course. The focus will be on abstraction that how do we look at various concepts abstract out the properties of those concepts and then study properties in the abstract level. What would be the advantage? Let me just write down. Is that visible? advantages of abstraction. First advantage of abstraction is uh, that it allows us to that is very clear that it allows us to study concept without unnecessary details just get rid of the specific details that are not relevant and you can just look at it only at the core aspects. And the second one also extremely important is that it allows us to study common properties of different concepts. You have multiple concepts, you abstract their properties out, some of them will be common. So, when you once you study the common properties that is applicable across the concepts. We will see examples of this and I am sure you have come across examples earlier as well. And third one which is again very important is that it allows us to take our on the properties that we have studied in abstract and apply it into a completely different context. Which is another way of saying that it allows for generalizations. So, we there is a specific concept we abstracted the properties out of studied those properties and now this is a abstract world. So, we can apply it anywhere that we wish to. So, in a sense what we study would be a much more general version of what that specific thing we started with from. That is three very big advantages of abstraction. Of course, there is a downside of it also which is that it becomes perhaps a little boring but or rather too abstract to too mathematical there is the intuition gets lost many times that you see them you know a lot of symbols and manipulations of those symbols and it is not clear why exactly are we doing it. So, it is therefore, it is very important to keep in mind the concrete concepts from which we have abstracted out. So, that we never lose sight of what is the uh, effect of our abstract manipulations on those concrete concepts. Any questions?
well let us see some examples abstractions and these are something that you have already come across. What are the two most fundamental objects in mathematics? Numbers, yes, numbers are one clearly. Operators and that is that you are talking about the that is an abstraction of when you want to study certain operations and then you use those, but I am saying uh, not yet going into the abstract world in the concrete setting in mathematics. What are the two most fundamental objects that we like to study? One is numbers. Second, properties. properties of various things. Sure, but objects, for concrete objects that we want to study. You have studied it for long in school. Variables is again an abstraction. Use variables to study some concrete things. What? Geometric objects, curves, planes, and surface various surfaces. That's also comes from the real life. Just like numbers, in a sense, come from the real life by count. For you want to count certain things, so you introduce and use numbers. Similarly, in real life, the whole world is. No, not just the whole collection of geometric objects, and you would like to study how these geometric objects behave, what are their properties. So, with this in mind, that is how the mathematics starts in ancient times. The study was done for numbers, on about numbers, and about the geometric objects. And already the abstraction, particularly in the case of geometric objects, was found extremely useful. Take for example a circle, that is a geometric object. Now, if I want to study properties of a circle. One way is to draw the circle and see you know, geometrically various properties by drawing whatever other curves and intersections. Do you know another way? Something that you have been using in the school very yes, so use compass that is geometric way of studying circle. You draw the circle lines and then see how they interact. Coordinate geometry, yes, you've been. That's what you did in the school. The, all the all these basic curves, you studied using coordinate geometry. And what does coordinate geometry give? Is for a circle, instead of drawing the circle, we write this equation. X square plus y square equals r square. And this represents a circle. So, now we introduce coordinates here which is center is at point 0 0 and there are any point of the circle is at coordinates are x y and the radius of the circle is r and then this circle is represented by this equation x square plus y square is equal to r square. And then suddenly we can study the circle by using this equation. You can differentiate it, get the tangent equation of the tangent at various points. You can look at multiple do two circles and see where they intersect. You can do all that you would do by drawing it pictorially. You can do it algebraically. Now, this is already an abstraction, because on its own this equation is just a collection of symbols. 
there is a x there is a 2 on top of x then there is a plus sign then there is a y 2 on top of y and then etc. Right. What we do is we assign meaning to this and the meaning we assign is that the x represents the x coordinate value of a point on circle the y represent the corresponding y coordinate of that point and this is a square x with 2 on top it is again a representation of multiplying x with itself and so on. So, what we did was that we used this abstraction to represent the circle with an equation and in such a way that all the properties of that circle are inherent in this equation and then we studied this equation. And that you as you would recall that coordinate geometry is extremely useful in deriving properties of geometric objects, things that you would not be able to prove using just the uh, pictures, you can prove using this abstraction. Okay, can you remember or give me an example of a property that you can some non trivial property that you could prove using coordinate geometry and then to a hyperbola does not intersect what the curve. Okay. Okay. I will believe you I do not recall this property, but if you are saying so that tangent to a hyperbola does not intersect the curve at any other point you may say. Yeah, there are two parts of the hyperbola and then it does not intersect ok fine that you can prove using this, but if you were to prove it using geometry how would you do that you can of course, draw a hyperbola and draw a tangent at one point and observe that it does not intersect, but that does not mean that for no hyperbola for no point on the hyperbola the tangent will not intersect the curve. So, not only you get an easier way of studying properties you get a more powerful way of studying properties by applying this abstraction. So, that is the observation that uh, we can prove that is a important observation and that already demonstrates this power of abstraction. Now, later on in the course I will show you further abstraction of the same thing that is we had a circle we abstracted it out as a equation and then I will go one more step this equation and this study of its properties comes under coordinate geometry. I will go one more step and abstract it out even more and that domain that field is called algebraic geometry. So, we will use more algebra to abstract out the circle and similarly other curves and use that representation to study properties. And it turns out that that representation is even more powerful than the coordinate geometry abstraction. And we can prove further or even more properties using that abstraction than with coordinate geometry. Okay.
let us stay on this picture for a little more while. Here you see that equation x square plus y square is equal to r square. This seems like an equation over numbers. Now, there is addition, there is multiplication in here, and addition and multiplication is what we do for, for numbers. So, that is a curious thing that we have that exists here. Firstly, there is this geometric object that has been seemingly translated into numbers. In fact, that is what the name coordinate geometry represents that you assign coordinates and coordinates are nothing but collection of numbers to every point and therefore, represent a geometric object as a collection of points and a collection of numbers and then you see uh, properties or relationship between those numbers that is given by this equation. The second curious thing about this is that not everything in this is a number. In fact, almost nothing is a number x is not a number y is not a number r is not a number. Numbers are well 1 2 3 4 1.1 if you want to allow real square root 2 those are numbers is x a number y r these are symbols these are not numbers. So, how can we treat them as numbers we seem to be treating them as numbers we're multiplying x as itself adding it to y r is y square so how can we treat them as numbers is something not right with this or are we taking too many liberties with our notation there is an abstraction that is happening here yes but we need to be very careful when we abstract in precisely defining the meaning of every symbol that we use in the abstraction. So, when we say that x, y and r here are going to be thought of as numbers is that justified. So, we are at liberty when we are doing abstraction we are at liberty to assign a meaning to any symbol that we introduce. What we need to ensure is that that meaning is consistent with the operations we carry out. So, if we say x represents a set of numbers a collection of numbers then what does x square represent? in what way the collection of numbers of x square related to collection of numbers x. Do we say that this collection is uh, multiply every number in from one collection to every number in other collection and then that overall number is in x other collection is that what we say that is not what we here intend to mean anyway. See, remember the our intention is there is a some num x y represents specifically one coordinate point it represents many coordinate point, but take one coordinate point then that is a number and then you take a square of that number in x square and y square takes a square of the y coordinate. The thing is that x and y do not represent a single number they do not stand for a simple but they stand for a collection number that is correct right. But that collection of numbers is also not any collection x represents the numbers that correspond to x coordinates of points lying on the circle. So, what is the meaning that we assign to x therefore, here do we say that either we can say just draw the circle look at the x coordinates of all the points and those represent those are represented by x here, but that is really kind of messy when firstly somebody has to draw the circle then assign the meaning 
or at least imagine a circle in the mind. Instead, what we can say here is that x represents any number, y represents any number such that collectively they satisfy this equation that x square plus y square is equal to r square. Does that make sense? So, x is some number here, y is some other number here, they need to satisfy this relationship x square plus y square is equal to r square. r is a fixed number, r is not does not change. So, we can take r let us say to be 1 itself. Then we say this equation corresponds to a collection of all pairs of numbers which satisfy this for x if you substitute the first of the pair for y substitute the second of the pair then this equation must be true. So, that is the interpretation we assign to this abstraction, but again it is not yet very let us say precise because I have said x can be in any number and y can be any number and such that they together satisfy this equation, but when I say number what do I mean? Do I mean integers? Do I mean rational numbers? Do I mean real numbers? Or do I mean complex numbers? There are different types of numbers out there. What would you suggest we should treat x as? What kind of numbers? Real numbers? Yeah, that is that is a natural way of thinking because this geometric object the circle we are thinking over a real plane. So, we can therefore, think of x and y as a real number that is good, but uh, suppose I want to study the rational numbers lying on the circle that is points which have rational coordinates which lie on the circle. Then we can say that it is uh, all the rational numbers x and y which satisfy this equation are the points of interest to us, which means that we are saying that now no longer think of x and y as real numbers, but think of them as rational numbers. The equation remains the same it's just that we are saying assigning a different meaning to x and y and we can change the meaning maybe some other time we want to study all complex numbers satisfying this equation. So, we change the meaning to complex numbers or something else. So, that abstraction remains the same, but the meaning we assign to it changes ok, which is very good thing because then if we study the properties of this in abstract domain then no matter what meaning we assign to this eventually those properties will continue to be true fine. So, that is an important observation. So, let me write it down.
this is not 100 percent true because each meaning will have its own quirks also, but at least the common properties we can handle simultaneously. So, this means we would like ideally to study this equation without assigning meaning to x and y that is what we want to do right. I have at least hopefully managed to convince you that that is a good idea. Let us not think of x as rational numbers let us not think of it as real numbers that we will do later when we as and when required. To begin with in a real abstract sense I will not assign any meaning to x and y. Are you with me? Do you agree with me that it is a good idea? Because it is a dangerous statement that I am making. Because if we do not assign a meaning to x and y, what is the meaning of x times x? How can you add x and y? That is one way of doing it, but then you have to do it at least three examples I gave rational reals and complex for each of them you have to then study it separately. Yes, what, but what if uh, so each addition may have slightly different properties. So, then you will have to uh, worry about those peculiarities of each meaning. Ideally, in abstraction, we would like to get rid of the specific quirks of the uh, uh, particular use, and we would just like to abstract it out so that we can study objects which are applicable across multiple meanings, which in this case we would be able to do if we do not assign meaning to x and y. The only hitch there is that and it is a big hitch that then how do we say how do we define addition and multiplication for x for y for a combination of these. About addition yes of course that is that is that is a solution yes you have given it. So, let us attack in a more direct fashion the concept of numbers itself what is a number ok who can tell me what a number is any object that is countable that is a number, but there are uncountable reals are uncountable. So, that is not a good enough definition as a by countables. as a power set of count countable elements ok. So, ok. So, let us me give a another argument against this let us pick up a collection of countable objects um, um, which is uh, maybe collection of all stars in the galaxy are they numbers as countable surely are they numbers can you add two stars and get a third star how about multiplying two stars that is not a good definition, let us 
try to come up with a better definition of it. Number. It's a good start. Yes, that's a good start. See what we really want to do with numbers is arithmetic on it. We have four fundamental arithmetic operations: addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. We would like with that's essentially how we play around with numbers, right? You do these operations for numbers. Now, of course, for certain collection of numbers, not all four of these operations are possible. For example, for integers, division is not possible. Addition, subtraction, multiplication is possible. But some others, for example, rational numbers, division is also possible. So, leaving aside this slight distinction, we would like to do arithmetic with numbers. So, let us define numbers as the collection of objects on which we can do arithmetic. But then we have to now define what does it mean to do arithmetic. And you pointed out already one important property of doing arithmetic, the closure. That is, if I add two objects, I should get a third object from my collection. Okay. Now, we are dealing with the numbers as just objects, we are not assigning any other meaning to them. So, we just have to, we now therefore, have to say what it means to do arithmetic on those objects. So, let us try to write down the properties we want of those objects. So, this is a formal definition of the closure property that capital A is the collection of objects that we are going to think of as numbers. The first requirement is that this collection of objects must admit the addition operation, which I am going to represent with the symbol plus. And this satisfies the following properties. The first one is the closure property that for any A and B in the collection A plus B must be defined and must be a another object in the collection. Okay. What other property should addition have associated with the excellent that 
for every A, B, C, you want to add all three of them, so it does not matter in which order you add them. Anything else? Commutativity yes, A plus B is same as B plus A. properties that are required that are required means that it does they do hold for typical numbers that we have in mind. So, we should abstract those properties out as well. One very important of these properties is this very special number 0 it has the property that if you add 0 to any other number, the number does not change and the 0 is called the identity of addition. add 0 to a you get a itself and finally, that is negative numbers or this property allows you to define subtraction, just addition is not the sufficient to operate on numbers you would also like to do subtraction. Subtraction is simply when you say a minus b we are adding a with minus b and what is minus b? Minus b is that that number which you when add to b you get 0. So, the fact that minus b exists is guaranteed by fifth property. So, we need this property in order to define abstraction uh, in order to define subtraction. And in terms of abstraction, we call this property the inverse property, the existence of inverse of every element. So, these are the five properties we require in order to define addition and subtraction. Have I missed out something? Can you or rather can you think of some other property that addition and subtraction should satisfy. So, happens that this is the comprehensive set of properties that the addition operation satisfies for numbers. And now, with this written down we can define numbers to be any collection with an addition operation subtractions comes for free which satisfies all these five properties. Of course, this is not quite there because a numbers also have multiplication and division and I have not used that. So, 
we should also have division and multiplication definition, but for now let us just stay on these properties and I will introduce the multiplication division slightly later to have the numbers. And the reason why I am stopping here for now is that uh, these properties for a collection is already a very interesting abstraction and I am sure you probably have seen about this. that uh, this collection. So, this collection with the addition operation defined as we just did is called a commutative group. The name has its own history let us not get into that why is it called a group, but the key thing or important thing is that groups are an abstraction which are extremely useful. We started with numbers in order to abstract that we came up to came to groups, but like I initially had suggested that once you do an abstraction you can apply it to completely different domains and that is true with groups as well. Let me give you an example of course, the obvious examples of groups you already know. Integers with addition operation that is a group that is how we started actually not just integers you take can take rationals with addition, reals with addition, complex numbers with addition these are all groups for obvious reasons commutative groups that is. By the way, yeah, I should have said that that if you drop property three, which is the commutativity property, in case of numbers, we don't need to drop it. That is definitely satisfied by numbers. But since we are would like to generalize this notion and apply it on the domains also, there are situations where this property doesn't exist, and in that case we will do away with this property for those situations and if you drop property 3 and the remaining property satisfied by a collection in that case the collection is called a simply a group. So, now come back to some examples. So, these are the obvious examples coming from numbers let me give you examples of groups which do not come from numbers ok any of you have a suggestion have you come across groups sometime earlier matrices yes excellent example yes. So, let us say n cross n matrices under addition that is a group we can the identity element is the all 0 matrix can add it is a commutative group also you can add uh, all the use other properties are easy to see that they are true for it ok. More examples permutations yes collection of permutations look at the permutations on numbers 1 to n each permutation by definition is a mapping from 1 to n to itself which is a 1 1 on to mapping. So, what is the addition operation for permutations how do you add to permutations compose under composition. So, 
composition of two permutation is a permutation. So, let us just quickly go through all the properties closure is true, associativity is true again it is very easy to see it is not commutative. If you take two permutations and it matters in which order you apply those permutations. Phi 1 composed with phi 2 is not necessarily equal to phi 2 composed with phi 1. phi 1 may map 1 to 2, phi 2 may map 2 to 3. So, if you apply first phi 1 and then phi 2, then you will map 1 to 3. On the other hand, if you apply phi 2 first, phi 2 may map 1 to 7 and phi 1 may map 7 to 20. So, if you apply first phi 2 and then phi 1, then 1 is goes to 20. So, it is definitely not commutative, but identity exists. What is the identity for permutation? The identity map 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, because if you compose it with any other permutation, you get back that same permutation. Inverse, inverse also exists. Inverse of a permutation is just the inverse map. If you compose the inverse map, you get the identity permutation. More examples. Q star, which I used to denote all non-zero rational numbers under multiplication operation that is a group. Why is that a group? Closure holds, associativity holds, commutativity holds, identity one is the identity inverse 1 by a. So, if a is a rational number 1 by a is also rational number and that is the inverse. So, this is actually a multiplication operation which is different than addition operation for numbers, but if we view it in that abstract fashion it is same as addition operation. This is already a remarkable fact which was not at all evident and this becomes evident only when we abstract out the properties of addition, abstract out properties of multiplication and see they are the same. Multiplication is repeated addition true, but uh, the fact that properties would remain the same is not at all clear. For example, if you start with integers, there also multiplication is repeated addition, but over integers under integers under multiplication do not form do not form a group because the inverse does not exist. But over rationals, they do form. So, this is a good time to close because uh, we have defined groups, we have given some examples of groups, and already thrown up certain and unexpected uh, facts. So, what I would like you to do is go back, think about it. Tomorrow we meet again at 12 and we will continue the discussion. <coughs>